peace be with you. It's great to know that these greetings from South Frankfurt Presbyterian Church are coming to you not only on Facebook and YouTube, but now even also on Channel 20, the local cable station in Frankfurt. Today's service and uh, every Sunday service now will be broadcast, aired on Channel 20 on Tuesdays and Wednesdays at 11 in the morning. I'm Marian Taylor, honored to be the pastor of this flock. And today we continue in the joy of the resurrection to look at how Christ's church was born. It began with the followers of Jesus hiding fearfully from those who disagreed with them. And yet they received Christ's peace and power. Today we're looking at how that happened for them and how it can happen for us too. Seminary student Heather Thumb Gerber will lead us now. Please join in the call to worship with me. The Lord has done great things for us and we rejoice. May those who sow in tears reap with shouts of joy. Those who go out weeping, bearing the seed for sowing, shall come home with shouts of joy, carrying their sheaves. We see your grace in the resurrection of Jesus Christ. We see your mercy in his forgiveness. Let us bring our hearts full of gratitude to the worship of God. We bring our thanks to the Holy One. trust is in God, who gives saving love without waiting until we are perfect. Let us confess. Merciful God, forgive our sinful ways. Full of our own plans, we fail to see you in the people around us. 
authoring our own lives, we sometimes turn real people into mere stage props. Eyes focused on what we want, we miss the treasures of new life you have given to us. All sorts of fears fill us, leaving less room for love. We repent. Help us to worship you in all our ways, so that we may serve your mission. Amen. The mercy of the Lord is everlasting. I declare in the name of Jesus Christ that we are forgiven. God's gift has made us whole again. Thanks be to God. The Presbyterian tradition has created a collection of statements by the church as a whole. Statements that deal with theological and social issues of various historical eras. The one called the Confession of 1967 has a section that is particularly appropriate on the Sunday after Easter. Let's read it together as an affirmation of faith. And then we'll hear a children's time message brought to us this week by Beth Metzger. In Jesus of Nazareth, true humanity was realized once for all. Jesus, a Palestinian Jew, lived among his own people and shared their needs, temptations, joys, and sorrows. He expressed the love of God in word and deed and became a brother to all kinds of sinful people. But his complete obedience led him into conflict with his people. His life and teaching judged their goodness, religious aspirations, and national hopes. Many rejected him and demanded his death. In giving himself freely for them, he took upon himself the judgment under which all persons stand convicted. God raised Jesus from the dead, vindicating him as Messiah and Lord. Glory be to the Father, and to the Son, and to the Holy Spirit. Amen. Let's do some deep breathing. When I say breathe in, Take a breath through your nose so big that your belly gets sucked in. I will show a countdown from three on my fingers. When I get to one, exhale the big breath through your mouth. Are you ready? Breathe in. Let's do that again. Breathe in. Breathing deeply helps calm our bodies and souls and minds, especially when there's a lot of stress going on around us. It helps us have some peace and stillness so that we can do what we want or need to do. In today's scriptures, the disciples are having a really, really hard time. Jesus had been crucified. And some of those people who had crucified him said and did mean things towards them because they had followed Jesus. They were so scared that they even locked themselves in a room away from everyone else. They didn't know what to do because Jesus had chosen each and every one of them to spread the loving word of God throughout the lands. But they were afraid. Jesus appeared to them and said, peace be with you. This reminded the disciples that the only way that they could do what they were chosen to do is to have peace in their minds, souls, and bodies. Later, the disciples went and spread the good news just like Jesus had taught them. When you feel stressed out about what's going on around you, take a couple of deep breaths and help yourself to some peace. Let's say a prayer. Dear Lord, thank you for reminding us that peace is possible even during stressful times. We love you, Lord. 
Amen. As we prepare now for Mark Overstreet to read to us the scriptures for today, let me uh, lead us in a prayer for God's illumination. O God, by your Spirit, tell us what we need to hear and to do to obey Jesus Christ, our Savior. Amen. Our first reading is from Genesis chapter 1, verses 1 through 5. In the beginning, when God created the heavens and the earth, the earth was a formless void and darkness covered the face of the deep while a wind from God swept over the face of the waters. Then God said, Let there be light, and there was light. And God saw that the light was good, and God separated the light from the darkness. God called the light day, and the darkness he called night. And then there was evening, and there was morning, the first day. A reading from the Gospel of John, chapter 20, verses 19 through 23. When it was evening on that day, the first day of the week, and the doors of the house where the disciples had met were locked for fear of the Jews, Jesus came and stood among them and said, Peace be with you. After he said this, he showed them his hands and his side. Then the disciples rejoiced when they saw the Lord. Jesus said to them again, Peace be with you. As the Father has sent me, so I send you. When he had said this, he breathed on them and said to them, Receive the Holy Spirit. If you forgive the sins of any, they are forgiven them. If you retain the sins of any, they are retained. The word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. When you travel internationally, it's always good to know how to greet people appropriately in each place. And for example, on one of my trips to the Middle East, I was told that it was good in Israel to say shalom and in Arabic speaking countries to say salam. Well, it means the same thing either way. They both mean peace. I rather liked that. And I'd be just as happy if we English speakers would just say peace and nod our heads instead of saying hi and shaking hands. This custom of saying peace goes way back. It was normal even then for Jesus to say, peace be with you when he first came in and saw his followers where they were gathered. But there was another good reason for him to start that way. After all, he knew that they would be startled to see him so suddenly and in a space that they had locked up. But why repeat it a few minutes later when the followers have already had time to realize it really is Jesus, they've rejoiced and celebrated, and then he repeated, peace be with you, as his lead in to saying, as the Father has sent me, so I send you. Could this mean that we can't be sent into the world as Jesus was unless we are in a state of peace? Peace be with you. As the Father has sent me, so I send you. God sent Jesus in peace, and that's the only way that we can be sent as he was sent. Well, frankly, that's a lot to ask. Who among us has not had to struggle to find inner peace and maybe even relational peace in this past year? In our lifetimes, there have been few years when we could identify so much as we do now with the followers who were locked inside because of fear. Even if you've never had to hide from someone who wished you harm, now you have some idea of what it was 
to hunker down for safety's sake now because of the pandemic. And the catalysts, the causes of fear for us have gone well beyond the pandemic. Massive fires lit up our national landscapes. Our social contract and democracy itself at times seemed in great jeopardy. There are frequent reminders that we have lots of armed people around who shouldn't have been able to get guns so easily. We have lots of reasons to long for that peace, both inner peace and relational peace with which Jesus greeted his followers. Being at peace is good for our sleep and good for our health. Our ability to be at peace is good for the people we love as our state of being affects them too. Our peace can keep us from falling in step with those who try to turn these times of social tension into something cataclysmic. Well, Jesus adds a very important item to that list of reasons to long for peace. He's saying that we can be part of his mission in the world, a mission of reconciling all people to God and to each other if we receive his peace and his power. So let's look at how we can receive it. You probably noticed that Jesus breathed on his followers immediately after commissioning them. After saying, peace be with you and sending them, commissioning them, he breathed on them and said, receive the Holy Spirit. In the Gospel of John, the commissioning and empowering of the church didn't wait until the celebration of Pentecost. It happened immediately. It happened right after the followers accepted joyfully that Jesus had been raised from the dead. Did the world ever have God's Holy Spirit before then? Yes, because we Presbyterians believe in God as Father, Son, and Holy Spirit, we recognize that God's willingness to breathe life into creation has always been there. The wind from God that swept over the waters in the book of Genesis chapter 1 became the breath of God breathed into the first human being in Genesis chapter 2. The breath of God brought new creation, life, and power into being again when Jesus said, Peace be with you, as the Father has sent me, so I send you. Then breathed on them and said, Receive the Holy Spirit. He created a body of believers with a mission, and it came to be known as the church. Well, breath and life are practically synonymous. Our bodies can't go long without air and its oxygen, and we gasp for it when deprived. If you or someone you know has had an asthma attack, you know this very well. If you've been trained to administer resuscitation techniques, you know it well as, as well. Our ability to connect people to oxygen supplements and even to help them breathe with ventilators has saved tens of thousands of people from succumbing to illnesses that jeopardize the ability to breathe. So the image of Jesus breathing on his followers is an image of giving life. And to the extent that the, that moment is meant as a reference to the Genesis creation story, we can also see that his gesture was giving a fresh start a fresh empowerment for humankind. Well, just as breath and life are intimately related, so are breath and peace. If you know meditation techniques, you know this too. Fear affects our breathing in a way that makes us feel anything but peaceful. We can restore that sense of peace by working on our breathing, as Beth Metzger talked about in today's Children's Time message. So Jesus' commissioning gesture of breathing was one that offered both life and peace. 
The story about the first followers and their fear tells us that God can make us into a people of life and peace even during the most stressful times. And I want to lift up an example of that. I want to illustrate that power for life and peace with the example of a Jew in modern times, and I'll explain why in a minute. The Paul Sawyer Public Library and Together Frankfurt sponsored an event this week in which the community could hear about the life of John Rosenberg as part of the Holocaust Remembrance Day. Our own Ernie Lewis moderated the event. <clears throat> well, I've known of John Rosenberg as a leader in fighting for justice and human rights for some time. But during the April 7 virtual event this past week, I learned much more about him. John and his wife, Jean, were instrumental in the civil rights movement well before they moved to Kentucky in 1970. And I learned that John was just a lad, about nine years old, I think, when he and some of his family came to the United States as refugees from the anti-Jewish program of Hitler and his Nazi party. He was Hans Rosenberg until the immigration official gave him the name John. And as so often the case, the poignancy of John's story is in the details. Details such as the night that his family had to leave their home. They lived next door to their synagogue because the Nazi soldiers were about to blow it up, blow up the synagogue. Details such as the insignia from the Buchenwald camp where his father spent, I think it was nearly three weeks before being released into the area, re released in the era before the final solution of mass murder began. And then there's this happy photo from John's first day of school. It's happy because he's holding a cone full of goodies and treats. Look at that photo and know that his was the first group of Jewish children to be excluded from first grade for their religion. His father quickly created the school for Jewish children where John enrolled for first grade. Another moving detail from John's story came when John's immediate family made it to South Carolina. Remember, the U.S. was still at war with Germany and South Carolina's country clubs still excluded Jews. But John's school teacher arranged for this little German Jew with rudimentary English to go speak to classes to educate them. Well, I wrote to thank Ernie for his role in this event, and Ernie wrote back referring both to John and his wife, Jean, and I asked his permission to quote what he said to me. They are very sweet and dear people, Ernie wrote. They belong to both a synagogue and a Quaker meeting. When they moved to Prestonsburg, he was vilified and almost run out of town, and later he was named Man of the Year by city government. He almost single-handedly defeated the broad form deed when Reagan almost destroyed the legal services program he built, he kept right on going and figured out a way to keep going. He served on my public advocacy commission all 12 years I was public advocate, Ernie said, referring to himself. Earlier in life, this small Jewish man was in the heart of Mississippi burning as well as Selma, which is breathtaking. He had to have learned that peace amidst hatred from the fire of his upbringing and his parents' example. Ernie used two words that I want to highlight. One is breathtaking. When we're amazed by someone's courage or something that's beautiful, it affects our breath. It's an opportunity for us to feel an influx of life and power in our own bodies. The second word is peace. He said, John had to have learned that peace amidst hatred from the fire of his upbringing and his parents' example. 
peace amidst hatred. We all need that peace. As for why I wanted to use an example of God's life-giving power and peace from the life of a Jew, it's partly because of what the Gospel of John says was causing the fear of Jesus' followers. The text says they were locked for fear of the Jews. Many of them were Jews themselves. So this is not about being afraid of people because they were Jewish, but because of the disagreement within the Jewish community about who Jesus really was. This kind of text in the Bible should never be used to buttress anti-Jewishness. My second reason is that it helps us see that God's work of breathing life and power into humans not only started before the church came into being, God's work also continues to go on outside of the boundaries of our faith community. The wind of God's breath blows where it will. We have many allies among God's God-fearing people everywhere. And third, I think we can take stories from such allies everywhere as a challenge to us, a good challenge. Our trials may not be the Holocaust or Mississippi burning, but we have difficult challenges too. We who believe that our Lord of life was tortured and killed, but then raised again from death, we of all people should breathe in deeply the peace and power that God is offering to us. We who embrace the good news of a fresh start for humanity by adoption into Christ, we of all people must resist fear so that Jesus can commission us to do his work in the world. He said, as the Father has sent me, so I send you. That means we are sent as ambassadors of peace and reconciliation. We're gonna need a lot of breath for that journey. So let's pray for God to grant us that. Let us pray. God of life, we, we want what you are offering, a fresh start, a common cause, and the peace and power to be your ambassadors. Breathe on us afresh this very day. We may have closed our doors, but you are not stopped by that, for you love us too much to leave us in fear. At the thought of you, we breathe out our fears and we breathe in your love and peace. Send us to, in your holy name, amen.
I invite you now to join me in a time of prayer, a prayer that will let us use our breath to invite God in, inviting God in to help us turn our fears into peace and our lives toward the world that God loves. I'll read the first phrase from the Bible, and while I do that, please breathe in. And then to join me in the second phrase, breathing out as you say that second phrase with me. Know that in God's Holy Spirit, you are being helped to find peace and power through these prayers. True vine and gardener, help us abide in you. Nothing can separate us from the love of God. Your perfect love casts out fear. Your will be done on earth as in heaven. As the Father has sent you, send us in peace. Send me, Jesus. Send me, Lord. Send me, Lord. Send me, Jesus. Send me, Jesus. Send me, now receive this charge and this benediction. Because the world is poor and starving, go with bread. Because the world is filled with fear, go with courage. Because the world is in despair, go with hope. Because the world is living lies, go with truth. Because the world is sick with sorrow, Go with joy. Because the world is weary of wars, go with peace. Because the world is seldom fair, go with justice. Because the world is under judgment, go with mercy. Because the world will die without it, go with love. And now may the gracious God of our Lord Jesus Christ go with us all to guide us into the light of the gospel and to gather us into righteous community, both now and forevermore. Amen.